Hello, thank you for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel. And together are going to be reading Plato's Republic. Okay, so first off here, we're going to then do a little bit of review, just a quick reminder of what we did last time. Not going into a lot of detail here, but just so that we can get on the same page and get ready to jump into the text. So I'm going to switch now to the text. I am still using the Perseus. From next week, we should be able to switch to PDF, and it'll be much easier to go through. It'll be easier for me anyway. Um, so we picked up where, um, what's his name? Sorry, Polo Marcus, the son of Cephalus. He inherited the conversation. He was the heir to all that is Cephalus's. And he quoted a guy named Simonides, who said that justice is to render to each his due. And then Socrates proceeded to question Polemarchus, and that's really what we were reading last week. We covered that whole conversation, where he questioned what does that mean? And they went through many twists and turns, which I won't go through now. Um, it's difficult to jump through this. It's not like a PDF where I can just... Um, jump to the page I want. But they did qualify it at some point with the qualification that is for the benefit of friends and the harm of enemies. So what does it mean to give to each his due? Well, you want to benefit your friends, you want to harm your enemies. And then from there, Socrates questioned him some more about that. Where they ended up with was at 335D. Let me jump to that, 335. Sorry, it's a little, I gotta scroll through it instead of jumping to the page. Where he says, um, by justice then do the just make men unjust, or in some do the good by virtue make men bad. And he realized, no, that doesn't work. Um, it's not the function of heat to chill, but it's opposite. And there are many examples. And then the conclusion, it is not then the function of the just man, Polemarchus, to harm either friend or anyone else. It wouldn't be the role of the just man, but the unjust man the opposite. And that was an argument that Polemarchus found convincing. And so he says that, and this is where we had ended off last time, he says, that is most true. And then Socrates says very well, since it has been made clear that this too is not justice, what else is there that we might say justice to be? So he's leaving it open. They've rejected everything else. They have a clean slate now, right? They've cleared away every idea they've had up to this point. They've done away with Simonides' statement that justice is to give each his due. Now the conversation is going to take a turn. And so now enters Thrasymachus. And Jacob, are you okay to read Socrates? And I'll jump sure. in wherever there's other dialogue. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll read the part that's not dialogue. So now Thrasymachus, even while we were conversing, had been trying several times to break in and lay hold of the discussion. But he was restrained by those who sat by him who wished to hear the argument out. And by the way, those of you watching um, with a different text, this is 336b. And uh, there will be a link in the description box, as always, for this, this website. This is the Perseus website. Okay, so he was restrained by those who sat by him who wished to hear the argument out. But when we came to a pause after I said this, he couldn't any longer hold his peace. But gathering himself up like a wild beast, he hurled himself upon us as if he would tear us to pieces. And Polemarchus and I were frightened and fluttered apart, and he bawled out in our midst. 
What balderdash is this that you've been talking? And why do you simple Simons truckle and give way to one another? But if you really wish, Socrates, to know what the just is, don't merely ask questions or plume yourself upon controverting any answer that anyone gives, since your acumen has perceived that it is easier to ask questions than to answer them. But do you yourself answer and tell what you say the just is? And don't you be telling me that it is that which ought to be, or the beneficial, or the profitable, or the gainful, or the advantageous, but express clearly and precisely whatever you say. For I won't take from you any such drivel as that. And I, when I heard him, was dismayed, and I looked upon him with, and in and, and looking upon him, sorry, I was filled with fear. And I believe that if I had not looked at him before he did at me, I should have lost my voice. But as it is, at the very moment when he began to be exacerbated, exacerbated by the course of the argument, I glanced at him first, so that I became capable of answering him. And I said with a light tremor, Thrissimachus, don't be harsh with us. If I and my friend have made mistakes in the consideration of the question, rest assured that it is unwillingly that we err. For you surely must not suppose that while if our quest were for gold, we would never willingly truckle to one another and make concessions in the search and so spoil our chances of finding it. Yet that when we are searching for justice, a thing more precious than much fine gold, we should then be so foolish as to give way to one another and not rather do our serious best to have it discovered. You surely must not suppose that, my friend. But you see, it is our lack of ability that is at fault. It is pity, then, that we should far more reasonably receive from clever fellows like you than severity. Good. Okay, we'll pause here for a moment. So what does Thrasymachus want? What does he want from Socrates? It reminds me of the last dialogue we read when mm. uh, some, uh, I forgot the, it, the other person's name, but they came in and they said, all right, Socrates, you you define it. Mm. Enough of your Right, Calicles, yes. Yes. Right, that's in the Gorgias for those watching. Yeah, so he's doing the same thing. You answer it. Now, he has some uh, rules, let's say, about how to answer. Some negatives and some positive. Do you remember what those were? Let's see if we can find those. Don't, it's, don't you be telling me mm. that it is that which ought to be, or the beneficial, or the profitable, or the gainful, or the advantageous. Yeah, so those are all the negatives. You can't use any of those answers. But what does he want Socrates to do? Clearly and precisely answer. Mm. Can he answer clearly and precisely if he can't use any of those? Possibly not. Mm -hmm. It would be impossible. If you go back over Polemarchus's discussion, you'll see these are the things they were talking about. What is of benefit? What is due? What is of profit? What is the advantageous? If you take all of these out... You have no discussion, but somehow he wants to take away all of this, but still express it clearly and precisely. So we want to see what Socrates is going to do, do with this. Um, so Socrates responded here that um, you should have pity on us. And he, on hearing this, gave a great guffaw, and he laughed sardonically and said, He God! Here we have the well-known irony of Socrates. And I knew it and predicted that when it came to replying, you would refuse. 
and dissemble and do anything rather than answer any question that anyone asked you. That's because you are wise, Thersimachus. And so you knew very well that if you asked a man how many are twelve, and in putting the question warned him, don't you be telling me, fellow, that twelve is twice six, or three times four, or six times two, or four times three. For I won't accept any such drivel as that from you as an answer. It was obvious, I fancy, to you, that no one could give an answer to a question framed in that fashion. Suppose he said, oh, oh, oh yeah, suppose he had said to you, Thrasymachus, what do you mean? Am I not able or am I not, am I not to give any of the prohibited answers? Not even do you mean to say, if the thing really is one of these, but must I say something different from the truth? Or what do you mean? What would have been your answer to him? Humph. How very like the two cases are. There is nothing to prevent, yet even granted that they are not alike, yet if it appears to the person asked the question that they are alike, do you suppose that he will any the less answer what appears to him? whether we forbid him or whether we don't. Is that then what you're going to do? Are you going to give one of the forbidden answers? I shouldn't be surprised if on reflection that would be my view. What then if I show you another answer about justice, differing from all these, a better one? What penalty do you think you deserve? Why, what else? than that which it befits anyone who is ignorant to suffer. It befits him, I presume, to learn from the one who does know. That then is what I propose that I should suffer. I like your simplicity, but in addition to learning, you must pay a fine of money. Well, I will when I have got it. And Glaucon jumps in to say, It is there, if money is all that stands in the way, Thrasymachus. Go on with your speech. We will all contribute for Socrates. Oh, yes, of course. So that Socrates may contrive, as he always does, to evade answering himself, but may cross-examine the other man and refute his replies. Why, how, my dear fellow, could anybody answer if in the first place he did not know, and did not even profess to know, and secondly, even if he had some notion of the matter, he had been told by a man of weight that he mustn't give any of his suppositions as an answer. Nay, it is more reasonable that you should be the speaker, for you do affirm that you know, and are able to tell. Don't be obstinate, but do me a favor to reply, and don't be chary of your wisdom, and instruct Glaucon here and the rest of us. Okay, so in this section, they're debating who should be the speaker, right? What does Thrasymachus want? He wants Socrates to pay pay him money, I guess, for mm. the, uh, for having to teach him. Uh, mm. justice. Mm. And he's saying here that he wants Socrates to answer questions, right? If Thrasymachus is going to speak, he wants money. Do you get the sense, though, that he really wants Socrates to speak? No. It, it seems like he just wants the, to one-up him. Mm. Yeah, he seems... What do you think of this? Um, where may go back? Um, this is at 337D. What then if I show you another answer about justice differing from all these? A better one. What penalty do you think you deserve? What does that tell us about Thrasymachus? Either of you. Jed, any ideas? I'll bring you in. Uh, 
uh, the idea of punishment is in its thought mm. as opposed to benefit mm. as the goal of such conversations, perhaps the conversations in which he's, uh, which he's had about justice in the past has been for the purpose of punishment? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know that he's ever had conversations about justice before, but he certainly does seem to have the attitude that conversation is about winning. Would you agree? Yes, to get money or to inflict punishment. Hmm. Yeah, and if you're wrong, it's not... Yeah, to punish someone implies that they're bad. Would you agree? Right. So being wrong means you're bad in some way. So he has a very mm -hmm. strange attitude about justice. And so even without seeing yet what his idea is, of what his um, definition is, we already have some idea that it's probably not going to be something that Socrates agrees with. Okay, let's go on to the next section. So this is 338a. Okay, so when I had spoken thus, Glaucon and the others urged him not to be obstinate. It was quite plain that Thrasymachus was eager to speak in order that he might do himself credit, since he believed that he had the most excellent answer to our question. Okay, so there we get his state of mind. So Socrates was reading him. That's the nice thing, I think, about seeing these first-person um, dialogues. There are only a few that are written from Socrates' point of view, and we get his little comments like this. So that's a nice thing. So we see that he's reading Thrasymachus, even though Thrasymachus is saying, you have to pay me money to hear my idea. He's actually quite eager to speak. Okay. Um, but he demurred and he pretended to make a point of my being the respondent. Finally, he gave way and then he said, here you have the wisdom of Socrates to refuse himself to teach, but to go about and learn from others and not even pay thanks, therefore. That I learned from others. You said truly, Th Thrasymachus, but in saying that I do not pay my thanks, uh, <laughs> sorry, but in saying that I do not pay thanks, you are mistaken. I pay as much as I am able, and I am able only to bestow praise, for money I lack. But that, pra that I praise right willingly, those who appear to speak well, you will well know forthwith as soon as you have given your answer. For I think that you will speak well. Hearken and hear then. I affirm that the just is nothing else than the advantage of the stronger. Well, why don't you applaud? Nay, you'll do anything but that. Provided only I first understand your meaning. For I don't yet apprehend it. The advantage of the stronger is what you affirm the just to be. But what in the world do you mean by this? I presume you don't intend to affirm this, that if Polydamus, the Pancratius, is stronger than we are, and the flesh of beeves is adv advantageous for him. For his body, this valen is also for us who are weaker than he both advantageous and just. Yeah, a lot of uh, words we don't use anymore, but this um, Pancratius is an athlete, like a wrestler. And um, beeves, I had to look this one up. Apparently, it's another word for beef. And viand is food. So this athlete, would it's good for him to eat meat to build muscle, I guess, you know, but it may not necessarily be for the rest of us. Okay, you're a buffoon, Socrates, and take my statement in the most detrimental sense. Not at all, my dear fellow. I only want you to make your meaning plainer. Don't you know, then, that some cities are governed by tyrants, 
in others, democracy rules, in others, aristocracy. Assuredly. And is not this the thing that is strong and has mastery in each, the ruling party? Certainly. And each form of government enacts the laws with a view to its own advantage. A democracy, democratic laws, a tyranny, autocratic, and the others likewise. And by so legislating, they proclaim that the just for their subjects is that which is for their, the rulers, advantage. And the man who deviates from this law, they chastise as a lawbreaker and a wrongdoer. This, then, my good sir, is what I understand is the identical principle of justice that obtains in all states the advantage of the established government. This, I presume, you will admit, holds power and is strong, so that, if one reasons rightly, it works out that the just is the same everywhere. It is the advantage of the stronger. Now I have learned your meaning. But whether it is true or not, I have to try to learn. The advantageous, then, is also your reply, Thrasymachus, to the question, what is the just? Though you forbade me to give that answer. But you did add there, too, that of the stronger. A trifling addition, perhaps you think it. It is not clear whether it is a big one, either but that we must inquire whether what you say is true, is clear. For since I too admit that the just is something that is of advantage, but you are for making an addition and affirm it to be the advantage of the stronger. While I don't profess to know, we must pursue the inquiry. Inquire away. Okay, so what is Thrasymachus's definition? of justice. The advantage of the stronger? Yes, right. And we see that back at 338C. It's the advantage of the stronger. Now there's a curious thing here that Socrates says towards the end of this section. I, too, admit that the just is something that is of advantage. So Socrates kind of agrees with his answer. So now we have something curious here. Socrates is going to continue questioning him, but clearly he doesn't agree in the same way, right? Now Socrates could at this point just say, I agree, we're done. Or he could say, I agree, but this is how I mean it. He could explain, but he doesn't do that. Why do you think he doesn't do that? Hmm. Maybe just because that's Socrates' way of, you know, he likes to ask questions and get to an exact uh, answer, so he sees hmm. some issues to iron out. Hmm. Okay, so then that would, then the next question would be, why is that his way? Why is it better to question the person rather than just say, this is what it is? Up here at the beginning of the section, it's a long section. Um, here you have the wisdom of Socrates to refuse himself to teach. Is that true? Does Socrates refuse to teach? Does he teach? No, he no. doesn't. He, he teaches. Well, what would it mean? What, what does Thrasymachus mean by teaching? Like sophistry, just telling them. Just telling them. This is the right. Yeah. Socrates doesn't do that. So Thrasymachus is right that Socrates refuses to teach. Think back to the Theotetus. We read that dialogue together a few months ago. 
what did Socrates explain there was his art? What does he do? Midwifery. Hmm. You can say a little of more. like ideas. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? He's able to bring forth the knowledge from the person he's he's talking to. Hmm. Right. Yeah, and a big part of his art is finding when the person is pregnant with a false idea. Right? There is a long section there about ridding people of what is false. And sometimes they get angry with him, but he's doing them a service. Right? So his job or his role, we wouldn't say his job, his role here in questioning people, it's not to teach them, but to rid them of what is false, to empty them so that truth can surface. Because he doesn't put truth in them. So a big part of this whole system is the idea is not to put knowledge into people, but to pull the wisdom we already, uh, the soul naturally has out, to clear away what is false. And so that's what Socrates does. And we see that, we saw that last week with Polemarchus, and we see it here with Thrasymachus as well. That dialogue with Polemarchus, it ended because Polemarchus was empty. He reached the end. He had no further um, theories about that Simonides quote. Right? He took that idea of what Simonides said. He thought he understood it. Socrates showed him he did not. And then he was empty. And that's where their conversation ended. He couldn't go any further. He reached that point of being empty, but he couldn't go any further. And now Thrasymachus jumps in. And Socrates told us right at the end of this section here, I agree with you. I like your idea. I too admit there is something that is of advantage. There's a sense in which Thrasymachus's definition of justice is correct. But he's not going to just tell him in what way it's correct. He has to empty Thrasymachus of his ignorance first, and us as the reader. And as readers, we have to go through 10 books, so we must have a lot of ignorance, (laughs) if that's what it takes to understand his definition of justice. But that's where it's going. Okay. Okay, anything to add? I don't mean to just keep running along here. Um, Either of you have anything you want to add? Okay. Okay, so um, it ended here with um, him saying that there's more to inquire about. Thrasymachus said, inquire away. And that's where I'll pick it up. I will do so. Tell me then, you affirm also, do you not, that obedience to rulers is just? I do. May I ask whether the rulers in the various states are infallible or capable sometimes of error? Surely they are liable to err. Then in their attempts at legislation, they enact some laws rightly and some not rightly, do they not? So I suppose. And by rightly, we are to understand for their advantage and by wrongly to their disadvantage? Do you mean that or or not? That. But whatever they enact must be performed by their subjects and is justice? Of course. Then on your theory, it is just not only to do what is the advantage of the stronger, but also the opposite, what is not to his advantage. What's that you're saying? What you yourself are saying, I think. Let us consider it more closely. Have we not agreed that the rulers, in giving orders to the ruled, sometimes mistake their own advantage, and that whatever the rulers enjoin is just for the subjects to perform? Was not this admitted? I think it was then you will have to think that to do what is disadvantageous to the rulers and the stronger 
has been admitted by you to be just in the case when the rulers unwittingly enjoin what is bad for themselves, while you affirm that it is just for the others to do what they enjoin. In that way, does not this conclusion inevitably follow, my most sapient Rasimachus, that it is just to do the very opposite of what you say? For it is in that case surely the disadvantage of the stronger or superior that the inferior are commanded to perform. Okay, and then Polemarchus is going to jump in here. Um, so we see this is really the first dialogue that Socrates has had with Rasimachus. Right. There was a little bit before, but... Um, not a whole lot, but this is really the first time that Socrates put an argument together and took him step by step, right? Do you affirm that um, obedience to rulers is just? And then uh, can they make a mistake? And so sometimes they legislate wrongly. And, and so he leads them to say, oh, therefore, if they follow those, um, if the ruler makes a rule that is a bad rule, hurts them, and people have to follow it, then people are doing what is to the disadvantage of the ruler. All right, so he tears his argument down. Now at this point, then, there's a little bit of an um, interlude here, where Polemarchus and a guy named uh, Clitophon are going to have a little back and forth. Um, do you mind reading this with me, Jacob, just so I'm not talking to myself? Um, sure. So Polemarchus jumps in, yes, by Zeus, Socrates, nothing could be more conclusive. Of course, said Clitophon, breaking in, if you are his witness. What need is there of a witness? Thrasymachus himself admits that the rulers sometimes enjoin what is evil for themselves, and yet says that it oh, is sorry, just... sorry, I think this is Polemarchus. Oh, sorry. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, I missed that too. What need is there of a witness? Thrasymachus himself admits that the rulers sometimes enjoin what is evil for themselves, and yet says that it is just for the subjects to do this. That, Polemarchus, is because Thrasymachus laid it down that it is just to obey the orders of the rulers. Yes, Clitophon, but he also took the position that the advantage of the stronger is just. And after these two assumptions, he again admitted that the stronger sometimes bid the inferior, and their subjects do what is to the disadvantage of the rulers. And from these admissions, the just would no more be the advantage of the stronger than the contrary. Oh, well. By the advantage of the superior, he meant what the superior supposed to be for his advantage. This was what the inferior had to do, and that this is the just was his position. That isn't what he said. And then Socrates jumps in. Never mind, Polemarchus. But if that is Thrasymachus's present meaning, let us take it from him in that sense. What was the point of this little interlude? Maybe to see how people are interpreting it, like defending his position or defending Socrates' position. Mm -hmm. And, you know. A couple things here. First, this idea of a witness. What is this all about? What is Polemarchus's point, that there's no need for a witness? I don't know. What would it mean to need a witness? Just to have someone be listening to their conversation like, like they are. Hmm. 
And what does the witness offer according to um, Clitophon, the idea that if you're his witness? An account of hmm. what was stated? Would having a witness to the argument um, give it any credibility? Give yes. credibility to Thrasymachus, for example. I, mean, I think so. I mean, when people think of justice, they probably think of the justice system and mm. in that you have witnesses and mm. testimony. Do you think Clitophon's response... So, so after that whole argument, Polemarchus jumps in and says, oh, yes, Socrates, that was conclusive. That argument you just made was very convincing. Clitophon's response is, well, of course, if you're his witness. Does that seem strange? It does. I don't, yeah, I don't know why he mentioned the witness thing. I mean, they're clearly witnessing it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're sitting there. You know, maybe he's, you know, mm -hmm. saying that he favors Socrates or claiming that he favors him. Mm. Yeah, if your friends agree with you, then you're right. Right, so that's a very strange idea, but I think we still, maybe we don't use this wording anymore, but I think this idea is still kind of around, like, there's a certain safety in numbers, right, if other people agree with you, if there's a witness. But I, what this argument is showing is the opposite, right, that the argument itself has power. We don't need a witness. And that's Polemarchus's position. So I'll give him credit again. Last week I gave him some credit. This time he gets some credit as well. That he says, what need is there of a witness? This is what they said. Thrasymachus himself admits that the rulers sometimes enjoin what is evil for themselves, and yet says that it is just for the subjects to do this. So the argument itself has power. Okay, so... This is, I think, what Plato is showing here. And then he also clarifies the differences between the different ways of interpreting, right, what, um, what Thrasymachus said. Clitophon found a way to try to save Thrasymachus. By the advantage of the superior, he meant what the superior supposed to be for his advantage. Right? And as Polemarchus pointed out, that isn't what he said. Right, So it's a save. But we see here that Socrates is not trying to capture somebody, not trying to trick anybody or corner them and say, okay, you're not allowed to change your answer. You have to fight for this thing. He says that if that is Thrasymachus' present meaning, if he wants to change it, if he wants to make that adjustment, that's fine. We'll go on from there. And then this is Socrates talking. I don't know why the quotation marks are on this side of the <laughs> Roman numeral 14, but it's section 14. So tell me, Thrasymachus, was this what you intended to say? That the just is the advantage of the superior as it appears to the superior, whether it really is or not. Are we to say this was your meaning? Not in the least. Do you suppose that I call one who is in error a superior when he errs? I certainly did suppose that you meant that. When you agreed that rulers are not infallible, but sometimes make mistakes. That is because you argue like a pettifogger, Socrates. Someone who focuses on petty details. Um... Why, to take the nearest example, do you call one who is mistaken about the sick a physician in respect of his mistake, or one who goes wrong in a calculation a calculator when he goes wrong and in respect of this error? Yet that is what we say literally. We say that the physician erred and the calculator and the schoolmaster. But the truth, I take it, is that each of these, in so far as he is that which we entitle him, never errs. 
so that speaking precisely, since you are such a stickler for precision, no craftsman errs. For it is when his knowledge abandons him that he goes that he who goes wrong goes wrong when he is not a craftsman. So that no craftsman, wise man or ruler, makes a mistake than when he is a ruler. Though everybody would use the expression that the physician made a mistake and the ruler erred. It is in this loose way of speaking, then, that you must take the answer I gave you a little while ago. But the most precise statement is that other, that the ruler, in so far forth as ruler does, he does not err. And not erring, he enacts what is best for himself, and this the subject must do. So that, even as I meant from the start, I say the just is to do what is for the advantage of the stronger. What do you think of Thrasymachus's current answer? Well, as he says, it's not how we, you know, say it. Uh, we do say, like, the physician mm. you know, made an error. So mm. we don't say that he's not a physician if he, you know, makes that error. Do you buy that argument? Does that seem convincing? Does that seem right? I, I, it doesn't convince me just because mm. that's not how the convention is. Mm. So you think it's just convention? Like if you were in the hospital and you needed, um, say you had an infection on your arm and the doctor amputated your arm by accident, you would just say, oh, well, he wasn't acting as a physician at that moment. So it's not malpractice. I would say he's, he's still a physician, <laughs> but he's a bad one. <laughs> so there's such a thing as a bad physician. Right, right. How can there be a bad physician if, in the precise way of being a physician, he never makes a mistake? Can those two theories hold at the same time? Possibly not, but <laughs> I think it's like a spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> so he's trying to wiggle out of the... He got caught before. Uh, he agreed that sometimes people make mistakes, and that caught him, right? So now he's trying to back out of it. So no craftsman, wise man, or ruler makes a mistake. I can't highlight here, so I'll put it from here. Um, so that no craftsman, wise man, or ruler makes a mistake when he is a ruler. And it's just the looseness of speaking, he says, that we uh, say they do. Now, Socrates... It does fit with... Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. It does fit with um, what we learn about knowledge from mm -hmm. uh, the symposium, mm -hmm. that if to be a craftsman or an artist requires the application of a knowledge, mm -hmm. in the symposium, we learned that even knowledge is something that uh, can leave us, and we have to be reminded of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we're in that stage where the, um, 340E, mm -hmm. where our knowledge has abandoned us, mm -hmm. would we therefore not be fulfilling the definition of the artist by not having the knowledge at that time and therefore not fit the criteria? Well, you're certainly not doing it well. You'd be, yes, you wouldn't be so. applying a knowledge. Mm -hmm. So what would you be doing mm -hmm. if you weren't applying a knowledge? Hmm. But you're functioning in the world as a schoolmaster, as a calculator, as a physician. Functioning as one. Hmm. But you but lack the art. One. Perhaps you're lacking the art. Hmm. Oh, hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. So that could be why this argument is, is convincing. Because normally we um, say somebody is doing something, we give them the title, 
mm-hmm. based on their knowledge. Mm-hmm. And if they don't have the knowledge, then it would follow that they are not that thing. Mm-hmm. But we're saying that in the world, we assign that title um, even when technically they can fall out mm-hmm. and not meet that criteria, not have the mm-hmm. art. So technically they're not the physician, Mm -hmm. but we still give them that role over that period of time, Mm. like as an average. Mm. Yeah, and here they're talking about rulers, right? So Thrasymachus' definition is that the ruler is making the laws, and so that person is functioning in the real world, right? Right. So his definition doesn't fit that his this adjustment he's making doesn't fit his definition. Right. Mm. So it sounds like the appeal of this de- mm. definition would work for perhaps the world of being mm. where um, that level uh, where something is given a name based mm. on its f- functioning Mm-hmm. It's accurate functioning mm. for as long as it is mm-hmm. in that pure sense. But mm. he's also applying that to our everyday mm. in the world of beco- uh, becoming mm. idea of ruler mm. in which that level of precision doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, in the realm of forms or ideas or, you know, edos, we would say that justice is always just, that truth is always true. Um, when we're looking at art as it's applied, we see more of a... And even in those other dialogues, we saw that there is a a scale. Like, people don't immediately jump to perfect knowledge. You go through right opinion, and there's understanding. And there's knowledge, there's the understanding of knowledge. Um, in the development of the virtues, we don't... Um, we don't just immediately jump to say Socrates' is state of mind. Right. Yeah. So this, yeah, this precise statement, I would say, does not fit the definition. Um, it does not fit justice in the way that Thrasymachus is talking about it as rulers ruling countries. Right, and even in the symposium, mm-hmm. when we do reach that state of knowledge, mm-hmm. there is further development in that last mm-hmm. stage. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah, but it is an argument that has some, there is some argument you can, you can defend it. There is some defense of it. <clears throat> and we like that this, idea of that precise way of talking. So we're going to see what Socrates is going to do with that word precision. <clears throat> Sorry, did you want to say something, Jed? The earlier argument about, um, mm. well, this particular argument about the ruler being mistaken, mm-hmm. and therefore it wouldn't be just to do what he said, mm-hmm. and also the idea of uh, justice being advantage. Mm-hmm. This really makes me wonder about Socrates' last days. For he said openly in the apology that Mm -hmm. your rulings are unjust Mm -hmm. and yet he followed them. He also said that this is going to be to your disadvantage Mm -hmm. and yet he followed them and allowed himself to be killed. Mm. So it makes me wonder about that. Mm. Yeah, that's the dialogue Crito. I'd recommend you look at that one. But I don't want to jump to that. I don't want to jump out of the discussion right now. Um, but we're going to see what he's going to do with this argument here. So he did, did give you say one. That, that mm-hmm. Crito answers those questions. Did you say it addresses that question of why he didn't run away? There it is. In this oh, game. interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah, so he gave the argument that okay, you say that um, justice is the advantage of the stronger. But if they make the wrong, if they make, if they err and make a rule that actually hurts them, then it would be to their disadvantage. So we're going to see what he's going to do with all of that. It doesn't mean, of course, that Socrates agrees with that argument that justice is the advantage of the stronger. He was just poking holes in 
the internal logic of Thrasymachus's argument. Okay, but let's go on then to the next sentence. We'll see what Socrates, next section rather, we'll see what Socrates is going to do with this. So then, Thrasymachus, my manner of argument seems to you pettifogging? It does. You think, do you, that it was with malice, a forethought, and trying to get the better of you unfairly that I asked that question? I don't think it. I know it. And you won't make anything by it, for you won't get the better of me by stealth and failing stealth. You are not of the force to beat me in debate. Bless your soul. I wouldn't even attempt such a thing but that nothing of the sort may spring up between us again. Define in which sense you take the ruler and stronger. Do you mean the so-called ruler, or that ruler in the precise sense of whom you were just now telling us? And for whose advantage as being the superior, it will be just for the inferior to act? Okay, so notice here now Socrates picked up that language, and now he's going to show that even in that precise sense, you're wrong. I mean the ruler in the very most precise sense of the word. Now bring on against this your cavils and your shysters' tricks if you are able. I ask no quarter, but you'll find yourself unable. Why do you suppose that I am so mad to try to try to beard a lion and try the pettifogger on Thrasymachus. You did try it just now, paltry fellow, though you may be, though you be. Something too much of this sort of thing. But tell me, (laughs) but tell me, your physician in the precise sense of whom you were just now speaking, is he a moneymaker, an earner of fees, or a healer of the sick? And remember to speak of the physician who is really such. A healer of the sick. And what of the lot? The pilot, rightly so called, is he a ruler of sailors or a sailor? A ruler of sailors. We don't, I fancy, have to take into account the fact that he actually sails in the ship, nor is he to be denominated a sailor. For it is not in respect of his sailing that he is called a pilot, but in respect of his art and his ruling of the sailors. True. Then for each of them, is there not a something that is for his advantage? Quite so. And is it not also true that the art naturally exists for this, to discover and provide for each his advantage? Yes, for this. Is there then for each of the arts any other advantage than to be perfect as possible? What do you mean by that question? Just as if you should ask me whether it is enough for the body to be the body, or whether it stands in need of something else. I would reply, by all means, it stands in need. That is the reason why the art of medicine has now been invented, because the body is defective, and such defect is unsatisfactory. To provide for this, then, what is advantageous that is the end for which the art was devised. Do you think that would be a correct answer or not? Correct. But how about this? Is the medical art itself defective or faulty, or has any other art any need of some virtue, quality, or excellence, as the eyes of vision, the ears of hearing, And for this reason, is there need of some art other than that will consider and provide what is advantageous for these very ends? Does there exist in the art itself some defect? And does each art require another art to consider its advantage? And is there need of still another for the considering art? And so on ad infinitum. 
Or will the art look out for its own advantage? Or is it a fact that it needs neither itself nor another art to consider its advantage and provide against its deficiency? For there is no defect or error at all that dwells in any art. Nor does it befit an art to seek the advantage of anything else than that of its object. But the art itself is free from all harm and admixture of evil, and is right so long as each art is precisely and entirely that which it is. And consider the matter in that precise way of speaking. Is it so or not? It appears to be so. Then medicine does not consider the advantage of medicine but of the body? Yes. Nor horsemanship of horsemanship but of horses. Nor does any other art look out for itself, for it has no need, but for that of which it is the art. So it seems. But surely, Thrasymachus, the arts do hold rule and are stronger than, than that of which they are the arts. He conceded this, but it went very hard. Then no art considers or enjoins the advantage of the stronger, but every art that of the weaker which is ruled by it. This, too, he was finally brought to admit, though he tried to contest it. But when he had agreed... Can we deny, then, that neither does any physician, insofar as he is a physician, seek or enjoin the advantage of the physician, but that of the patient? For we have agreed that the physician, precisely speaking is a ruler and governor of bodies and not a money-maker. Did we agree on that? He assented. And so the precise pilot is a ruler of sailors, not a sailor. That was admitted. Then that sort of a pilot and ruler will not consider and enjoin the advantage of the pilot but that of the sailor whose ruler he is. He assented reluctantly. Then, Thrasymachus, neither does anyone in any office of rule, insofar as he is a ruler, consider and enjoin his own advantage, but that of the one whom he rules and for whom he exercises his craft and he keeps his eyes fixed on that and on what is advantageous and suitable to that in all that he says and does. Good. Okay, we kind of a long section here, but there was a section that's kind of strange. Um, the idea of there being no defect or error at all that dwells in any art. Does that make sense? Do you understand that section? Does this go back to when he was trying to say the precise definition does not include like the bad physician? It's just the mm -hmm. physician that does mm -hmm. does it uh, what he's supposed to do. Yeah, here we're looking at the art itself, so not the person who's the physician, but the art of medicine, for example. So maybe it goes back to what Jed was saying mm. about the form of that art, like the form mm. of the medicine would just be the good of that art. Mm. And why is that important for his argument? What's the next line here? Why does that follow? nor does it befit an art to seek the advantage of anything else than that of its object. Right. They got to the, you know, the physician is there for his patient. Mm. And so the ruler is there for his subjects. Mm. So 
it's not for his advantage that he's the ruler. It's mm. for the advantage of his subjects. Hmm. Right. So it's the the art itself doesn't have any defects. It's not acting for its own benefit. Therefore, the art is for the advantage of those that are the object of it. How does this destroy Thrasymachus's argument? Right, so he took it in that precise sense. Oh, you want to talk about this precise sense? Okay, let's take that definition. Still, your definition falls apart. Yeah, pretty thoroughly uh, mm. debunks what he said mm. since he was talking about the advantage of the ruler in the money-making or personal mm. advantage way, but uh, yes. that's that's not in the, in the art mm. of being a ruler. It's not mm. for your benefit. It's for the mm. benefit of the ruled. Mm. Yeah, and here we also have a definition of art. So he was presenting this as a response to Thrasymachus' definition of justice. And this is why your definition of the ruler doesn't work. But he also gave us a broader definition of art. How would you summarize his definition of art? Based on what's here. Just taking what's here. I think you pretty much have said it, but just to make it more okay interesting. yeah th mm. just the like what's what's good of that art mm. for the subject of mm. that art mm. yeah right so an art has to be a knowledge that applies to benefits the what well, goes i was quite the subject but the object the person okay. being yeah now notice here that he gives a number of different examples, like the doctor and the pilot. Um, who else did he give? But he does not give the philosopher. He didn't use the philosopher, but that's where it's going. Right, that was left out here, but eventually that's where it's going. Okay, anything else about that before we go on? Okay, so that definition of art, though, is a key point in in this dialogue, this idea of what is art. And it's a key idea, actually, in all of Platonism. So I don't mean to like skip over that section. So I want to make sure that we're, there's nothing else to add to that right now. We all have this idea of art. Okay. And we're talking yeah. about it mm -hmm. in the ideal sense. Yes. Yes. Right. Because when I was reading and it said, like, um, isn't there um, defects? We pointed out that in the everyday world, yeah, there are mm. defects. That's how come... Mm. You in know, the practice, make... in the application of art. Yes. R right. Like in even medicine, we might not know everything about mm. medicine yet. Mm. Right. But also the, the, the idea of um, having something that looks out for itself. Mm -hmm. So if you're a doctor, you want to practice in a way that keeps the art of medicine alive. Mm -hmm. you, you want to uh, protect the integrity of um, the art of being a doctor. So there is something that you, some things that you would do in order to look out for the art itself mm -hmm. so that the art of medicine doesn't fall into disrepute. So while the object is the central focus, there is some consideration about maintaining the integrity of the art and the sure. reputation of the art mm -hmm. and looking out for the art and maybe even improving it to overcome mm -hmm. the, the, de the deficits. But these are all things that are in the everyday world and mm -hmm. do not apply to the pure art of dentistry that would exist exactly. in a pure form. It's not the definition of art. Yeah, in practice, of course, we want to grow. We Whatever our passion is, whether it's medicine or philosophy or whatever, we want to grow, and we want to learn, and we want to. We find benefit in doing what we do, but that's not the definition of art in that precise sense that he's using it. That's right. right. But then the idea of maintenance mm -hmm. is interesting, because like the example that I gave of the doctor not wanting mm -hmm. to act in a way that mm -hmm. puts medicine into disrepute, mm -hmm. but there wouldn't. If 
the art of medicine itself doesn't mm -hmm. look out for its internal integrity. Is there some higher principle that protects the uh, protects and maintains the wholeness of the individual arts? So, as he said here, an art of the arts. Hmm. Well, they're just talking about the art in the precise sense here, so I don't want to go beyond the, the text. But that was something that came up in a different dialogue where we talked Well, here he said, um, mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. if it doesn't look out for itself, mm -hmm. then it would need an art to look out for that. Mm -hmm. But if that's a principle, then that mm -hmm. art would need an art to look out for mm -hmm. that, and so on, and ad, on ad infinitum. Right. Right. Unless, mm -hmm. of course, there is mm -hmm. um, one step above the art of medicine, mm -hmm some sort of art or principle that is specifically focused on the wholeness and the maintaining of all arts. Well, I don't think he was suggesting that that's his answer. He was saying that the art itself is perfect. And so that's why it doesn't seek its own advantage. Right. I guess mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, some metaphysical principle that's mm. dedicated to maintaining mm. the holes of mm. all of the forms. Mm. Yeah, you're getting into philosophy as an art, but he's not he didn't bring that in here. So that that's here they were just getting the basic definition of art. Okay. Right, right. Okay. So they're talking about mm. the forms but not in this higher sense. Mm. Uh, so we, when we had come to this point in the discussion, and it was apparent to everybody that his formula of justice had suffered a reversal of form, Thrasymachus, instead of replying, said, Tell me, Socrates, have you got a nurse? What do you mean? Why didn't you answer me instead of asking such a question? Uh, oh, sorry, I think that's still Socrates. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Why didn't you answer me instead of asking such a question? Because she lets her little snotty run about driveling and doesn't wipe your face clean, though you need it badly if she can't get you to know the difference between the shepherd and the sheep. And what, pray, makes you think that? Because you think that the shepherds and the need herds are considering the good of the sheep and the cattle and fattening and tend them with anything else in view than the good of their masters and themselves. And by the same token, you seem to suppose that the rulers in our cities, I mean the real rulers, differ at all in their thoughts of the governed from the man's attitude toward his sheep, or that they think of anything else night and day than the sources of their own profit. And you are so far out concerning the just and the unjust, I'm sorry, the just injustice and the unjust and injustice, that you don't know that justice and the just are literally the other fellow's good, the advantage of the stronger and the ruler, but a detriment that is all his own of the subject who obeys and serves. While injustice is the contrary and rules those who are simple in every sense of the word and just, and they being thus ruled do what is for his advantage who is the stronger and make him happy in serving him but themselves by no manner of means. And you must look at the matter, my simple-minded Socrates, in this way, that the just man always comes out at a disadvantage in his relation with the unjust. To begin with, in their business dealings in any joint undertaking of the two, you will never find that the just man has the advantage over the unjust at the dissolution of the partnership, but that he always has the worst of it. Then again, in their relations with the state, if there are direct taxes or contributions to be paid, the just man contributes more from an equal estate and the other less. And when there is a distribution, the one gains much and the other nothing. And so when each holds office, apart from any other loss, the just man must count on his own affairs falling into disorder through neglect while because of his justice makes no profit from the state, and there too he will displease his friends and his acquaintances by his unwillingness to serve them unjustly. But to the unjust man all the opposite advantages accrue. I mean, of course, 
the one I was just speaking of, the man who has the ability to overreach on a large scale. Consider this type of man, then, if you wish to judge how much more profitable it is to him personally to be unjust than to be just. And the easiest way of all to understand this manner will be to turn to the most consummate form of injustice, which makes the man who has done the wrong most happy, and those who are wronged and who would not themselves willingly do wrong most miserable. And this is tyranny, which both by stealth and by force takes away what belongs to others, both sacred and profane, both private and public, not little by little, but at one swoop. For each several part of such wrongdoing, the malefactor who fails to escape detection is fined and incurs the extreme of contumely. For temple robbers, kidnappers, burglars, swindlers, and thieves, the appellations of those who commit these partial forms of injustice. But when, in addition to the property of the citizens, men kidnap and enslave the citizens themselves, instead of these opprobrious names, they are pronounced happy and blessed, not only by their fellow citizens, but by all who hear the story of the man who has committed complete and entire injustice. For it is not the fear of doing, but of suffering wrong, that calls forth the reproaches of those who revile injustice. Thus, Socrates, injustice on a sufficiently large scale is a stronger, freer, and a more masterful thing than justice. And as I said in the beginning, it is the advantage of the stronger that is the just, while the unjust is what profits man's self and is for his advantage. So finally, Thrasymachus is telling us what he really thinks. Now, what is his... Now, you see, before Socrates was giving arguments, he was following logic and taking it step by step. What is Thrasymachus doing? He is (laughs) giving examples, but of, you know... uh, the opposite situation, basically saying how injustice is so powerful and gets gets you what you want, and you know, kind of convincing. I think some of what he says rings true to me. Like it reminds me of the like why people lie is to uh, essentially like get out of the punishment they would they would get from telling the truth and in the same way like doing the injustice is a way for them to you know uh, escape their the punishment for mm-hmm. the the crimes they're committing um so is he yeah. falling back on logical reasoning is he following the steps of logic the way Socrates is? No, he's not. What is he drawing on? Real world examples. Hmm. Good. Yeah, right. He's just talking from his experience. And that's that's what he's got. And so this is what Socrates then has to deal with, right? He This is why he couldn't, why Socrates couldn't just say, this is what justice really is. So what is he going to have to empty Thrasymachus of? All of this. I guess these real <laughs> yes. world examples. Of- yes. <laughs> right. He's got a lot of ideas. He's, he's quite full. Would you say, look how long this section is. Right. He's quite full of um, beliefs about the real world and about justice. And this is what Socrates has to contend with in order to answer this question of what is justice. <clears throat> Any other thoughts about this before we go on? We may be able to do one more section. Seems like he didn't understand Socrates in his last <laughs> mm. part <laughs> because Socrates, like his, his example with the shepherd, mm. like... He is a shepherd insofar as he's good at taking care of the flock. Like, Mm. yeah, he's taking care of the flock for his own advantage. Mm. But if he wasn't able to have the the flock healthy and 
you know, uh, mm. good good to bring to market, then he wouldn't mm-hmm. be a, a good shepherd. Mm. So yeah, I, I just feel like mm. he's misunderstanding. <laughs> he's getting uh, yeah. angry. But that is a good example of the real world response to Socrates' definition of art, right? Yes, right. you're a good shepherd and you're taking care of the animals, but it's not for their benefit. It's because you want to eat them. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> and I think that's a view that many people have of the divine as well, <laughs> that maybe we're all like, you know, God is fattening us up <laughs> or something. Who knows what's going to happen on the other side? You know, like I've heard those kind of theories, you know, and people think it's very clever, you know, to throw all these ideas around. Um, but it shows a lack of understanding, right? Definitely. But, but it is a good real world example, right? But um, rulers, when we look around, we do see that farmers are, yeah, they're taking care of their um, their crops and their animals, but it's not because they, they, they value the tomato. It's because they want to eat it. And same with the sheep. We want the we want their their fur. We want to eat the animals. We use that we use the cows for milk. We use the chickens for eggs. It's for our advantage. We see that with our rulers as well. Yeah, they want to keep us happy. We actually saw that in the last dialogue. Yeah, they keep us happy, but it's for their own popularity and their own reputation and whatever. So his real world example fits the real world. And that's what makes this dialogue, I think, so fascinating that... Plato sees this, and I think that he did a good job of presenting Thrasymachus in an honest way. He didn't make him like a straw man. He made it, he gave the argument as strong as he could, right? This is an intelligent person's real world example. Thrasymachus is not an idiot. He's intelligent, and he's presented here, I think, in an intelligent way, and he gives an argument that fits the real world. And this is what Plato has to answer to and what Socrates has to answer to. Jed, I saw that your your, your microphone went on. Did you want to say something? Would we say that this is an example of understanding justice within an unjust system? What do you mean? In that, uh, well, in a system where we have punishment and not correction Mm -hmm. in a system where there's this um, feeling of scarcity or Mm -hmm. um, like in our day it's manufactured artificial scarcity where uh, people get stuff at the expense of other people Um, and all of these examples Mm -hmm. um, the person paying well the, the millionaires and billionaires who pay no tax get more of the stuff Mm-hmm. Um, and those who pay pay a lot can be a burden on their friends. Mm-hmm. So these are all real world examples mm-hmm. that happen yeah. within oh, yeah. a scope of a framework which is mm-hmm. itself unjust. Yes. So if you're living in an unjust world, this is what justice. It, what, this is how justice would appear um, to the people who are benefiting from it. I would say the people who are not benefiting are lamenting that there's no justice in the world. <laughs> right. So he's yeah. saying mm. with this is how an unjust world defines justice. Yes. And if you're living in that world, this is mm. what you would do to mm. live a better life. Mm. Yeah. But that's with... Yeah. yeah, so I would say that... Thrasymachus is a relativist, that he doesn't care what justice is truly. This is how it functions in his world, and so that's what it is. Yeah, it's interesting that we're jumping back and forth from the ideal and Mm -hmm. um, the way it's manifested in our everyday world. Mm -hmm. Like his, his talking about the um, uh, doctor mm-hmm. in the ideal didn't mm-hmm. really fit. 
Mm -hmm. So we can't talk about being a the art of medicine in the in the ideal because mm -hmm. we're going to allow for doctors to make mistakes. Right. But now when we're talking about justice, we're going the other way. We said no, we're mm -hmm. only talking about it in the ideal. Um, oh, because you said we're going to look at it in the precise way. That was right. Okay, mm -hmm. it's it's a principle mm -hmm. of this particular argument. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting the idea uh, how the idea of scarcity plays into uh, this guy's thinking. Um, the benefit that he's looking for happens in a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. For me to get benefit, I have to um, pay less taxes, or I mm -hmm. have to um, mm -hmm. not be caught, or mm -hmm. I have to um, be like uh, these robbers or. Mm -hmm. I know, he doesn't be like a robber, but mm. he has to uh, get away with doing mm. things. He has to be like a robber. <laughs> he has to be like a robber, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which only makes sense in a mm. zero-sum game. Mm. If you had an idea of advantage mm. where a rising tide lifts all ships, mm. you wouldn't be thinking in this way. Mm. That's right. Yeah. That's very interesting because mm -hmm. a lot of people think that um, – this idea of justice that he's talking about here, which is very common nowadays, mm -hmm. some people think that this mindset is being taught to us by introducing artificial scarcity. Mm -hmm. We're told in our capitalist world, oh, there's mm -hmm. not enough to go around and we right. will have to be at each other's necks, mm -hmm. which is not true, right. but it's introduced specifically to create this particular mindset of this mm -hmm. particular man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we're seeing here, and then to your point about going back and forth between the ideal and the real world, is that Thrasymachus is limited by his understanding of the real world. That's his limit. So he's trying to be precise, but it's, um, it's a distortion of being precise because he's limited to only seeing the real world. And so this is his idea of justice. Whereas Socrates does have that wider perspective. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. So important to have that mm -hmm. figure to come in with mm -hmm. the wider perspective mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. sort of wake us up. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. this is the only world that I've known. Right. Mm. And yeah. add to that how what I was saying about the idea of artificial scarcity in, in capitalism, mm -hmm. not only is this the only world that you have, it can be so easily manipulated. And so well, we believe, oh, there's not enough to go around and, and we should be at war or we should mm -hmm. be fighting or whatever, mm -hmm. which is not true. But having this other figure who has a mm -hmm. higher perspective to come in and, and, I don't know, burst our bubble? Mm hmm yeah, and that's exactly what this dialogue is. So this is the view of justice. So Plato is giving us this view of justice in book one because this is what Socrates has to answer to. This is what the whole dialogue has to answer to. That this is what most people think justice is, but it's not. And it's going to take um, a number of books. It's in book four where he gives his definition of justice and then there's application of it after that. So it's going to take many, many pages to get to lay out his definition of justice, but it's because he has to tear down this one. Right? He has to give a response to this because most people are like Thrasymachus in that we have that limit of most people... You know, if you're not a Platonist or you're not part of some system that teaches justice as this system does, then you're going to have this world view. And you're going to read this section and say, Thrasymachus is the most intelligent character in the dialogue so far. And you're going to think, this is, what, this is how justice plays out. You can't imagine what, what Socrates is going to do from here. And so that's what makes it fun and exciting, is to see what he's going to do to... Uh, to tear this down, because he can't start from these assumptions. He can't just say, Thrasymachus, this is what justice is. It is the advantage of the stronger, but what I mean by advantage and what I mean by stronger is different than what you think it is. He can't just say it, because Thrasymachus is too full of his own ideas. 
He has to be emptied of those, and we as readers have to be empty of whatever our ideas are before we can take in this other definition. So that's where it's going. Um, so I think we'll stop there for today, and then we will pick it up from here next time to see how is Socrates going to counter this real-world view of justice. Okay, so... Um, we're okay. Any other final comments? Okay, so we'll end it there. And those of you watching on YouTube, as always, if you don't already subscribe, I would appreciate if you did. It really helps the channel and give this video a like. And from next week, we're going to be using a PDF. So we'll be, I'll be able to scroll a little better. It'll be nicer for me. And so I will include the PDF along with the link to this website in the description box. Okay, so thank you all very much, and I hope you'll join us next time. So long.